Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Peace be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome again to this uh, new episode of the Kyle series on Islam and biomedical ethics. Uh, today, uh, I want to share with you some uh, ideas and analytical remarks about the Islamic legal and religio-ethical discourse on organ donation. Uh, this episode will be dedicated to uh, the so-called biomedical context. By this, I want to argue that opinions expressed by Muslim religious scholars, whether those in the pre-modern time or their uh, counterparts in the modern time, the opinions they express when it comes to organ uh, transplantation and organ donation, these opinions are not exclusively based on a specific reading and interpretation of uh, some uh, passages in uh, uh, two main sources of Islamic legislation, namely the Quran and Sunnah. I argue that these opinions are uh, highly influenced by the biomedical context which uh, affects uh, the um, final conclusions of these religious scholars. Uh, so we need to take biomedical contexts into consideration and we need to take it seriously when we analyze the opinions of Muslim religious scholars on organ donation. And I will start with the pre-modern discussions. Uh, these pre-modern discussions uh, have been quoted by contemporary religious scholars when they addressed the religio-ethical questions raised by the new technology of organ transplantation. What are these uh, discussions that contemporary Muslim religious scholars found relevant? Uh, Avicenna, the uh, well-known Muslim physician uh, who wrote his voluminous and amazing uh, medical textbook Al-Qanun, the Canon, uh, he discussed uh, a medical issue which seems to be, uh, have been uh, commonplace, uh, commonplace in uh, society at this time, which is bone grafting. Uh, when um, uh, specific parts of the body, especially the bones, are severed from the body, there have been, it seems, there have been possibilities to re-adjoin or reattach these parts or these bones. Uh, uh, some texts also spoke about teeth, about uh, uh, noses. And uh, um, uh, because of this medical possibility that some parts of the body, when it comes to the bones or the teeth or the nose or the ear even, some speak, uh, spoke about it, uh, when they want to um, uh, treat uh, these severe parts of the body, uh, uh, there was medical possibility to do this. And because of this medical context, we find uh, that Muslim jurists, especially in the 13th century, the same century in which, uh, uh, during which Avicenna lived, uh, they also, uh, these Muslim jurists spoke extensively about uh, what is permissible and what's not permissible concerning, for instance, bone grafting. Uh, of course, there is a, a great level of diversity in opinions expressed by pre-modern religious scholars on how to reattach, how to rejoin, or how to transplant bones into the human body. But generally speaking, one can say that their main concern was the source of the organ to uh, of the tissue or the organ to be transplanted. For instance, uh, um, is it from the same person? So we will rejoin or reattach uh, uh, some of the bones, uh, the nose or the teeth, uh, the tooth or the ear of the same person, which we call now autograft. Or is it from, um, uh, for instance, uh, a deceased animal, from an animal which we call xenograft. And uh, their first option was autograft that the severe parts of the body will be reattached, will be joined, rejoined to the body of the same person. And if it is from a, a, a non-human origin, from an animal, they always preferred uh, an animal which has been ritually slaughtered because the parts of such an animal will be considered ritually pure 
from an Islamic legal perspective. So you will have pure material transplanted into the human body. But if the source of these bones is an animal which has not been uh, ritually slaughtered or it has porcine origin from a pig for instance then uh, this part will be considered impure and then will create some difficulties from an Islamic legal perspective. We find for instance Imam al-Nawawi, a very important Muslim religious scholar from the 13th century in his book Minhaj al-Talibin, he discusses the issue uh, in detail specifically about the source of the bones. Is it a human being, ritually slaughtered animal, an animal which is not ritually slaughtered, etc. And we find also Imam al-Shirbini from the um, uh, 16th century uh, who gave a commentary on the textbook of al-Nawawi and he said that uh, the first option should be given to uh, 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 bones from the same person Bones from ritually slaughtered animal because these all are pure. But when it comes to an animal which is ritually uh, uh, not ritually slaughtered or bones of a porcine origin, this should be avoided unless people of expertise in Arabic, Ahlul Khibra, people who have a know how of bone grafting, only when they say that this is the only option av available this is the most efficient option available, then we can transplant bones harvested from an animal which is not ritually slaughtered or um, um, we will use uh, um, uh, um, uh, porcine bone, uh, bone grafts. Also Imam Al-Qazwini uh, in his uh, uh, book uh, Marvels of Creatures, um, um, uh, in his book Wonders of Creatures and Marvels of existing things, uh, he spoke about the same issue and he said that, uh, he notes that porcine bone grafts function more efficiently than other uh, xenografts. And uh, again here we see the link between medical information available and the possibilities offered by the Muslim jurist, by the faqih, when it comes to transplanting specific tissues or specific organs. So again we stress that biomedical context was not detached from the juristic one, they were interrelated and intersected uh, uh, in uh, a clear way. Uh, thank you very much and see you in the next episode on the modern discussions on organ transplantation. Thank you very much.